She is the author of a collection of stories and nine other novels. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is on the faculty of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Jill McCorkle published her first two novels on the same day in 1984. Since then, she's published 11 other books, most recently the short story collection, Old Crimes. Um, we hope you enjoy the event. Remember, you can grab a copy of The Road from Bellhaven. There actually might be one copy left, or maybe zero, but we can take an order. Okay. <laughs> um, we can always get you a book plate signed, though. So if you want to take it one, we'll get you a signature. Um, and Jill has several books up there as well. So thank you. Enjoy the event. <laughs> On these occasions, the, um, my former elocution teacher rises up before me, saying, from the diaphragm, Margo. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be back at Five Eve Books after a really a very long absence, nearly a decade we worked out. And I'm thrilled to be talking to Jill McCorkle, my wonderful friend, a wonderful writer. If you haven't read Hieroglyphics and Old Crimes, her two most recent books, you should just leave now and get them. <laughs> <laughs> and don't waste your time here. <laughs> I'm going to read the opening of The Road from Belhaven. It's set in 1880s Scotland. The Road from Belhaven. The summer she was 10, she learned not to speak of it. She told the hens, she told the cows, she told the pond at the bottom of the field and the ducks who swam there, and her pet jackdaw, Alice. But she did not tell her grandparents, Rab and Flora, or Hugh, the farm boy, or Nellie, who had helped in her, the house when she, Lizzie, was learning to walk and whom they still saw every week at the Kirk. The first picture came on a drich November day. Her grandmother was in the dairy skimming milk, her grandfather in the fields digging potatoes. Lizzie was beneath the kitchen table making scones for her doll when the flagstone floor and her bowl and spoon disappeared. Instead, she was watching her grandfather, his shirt sleeves rolled up, scything hay in the meadow by the river. He was working his way along the bank, cutting wide swathes. One moment the hay was upright, the next fallen. At the end of the row he stopped to sharpen the scythe. Lizzie could see his shirt clinging to his back as he ran the whetstone back and forth. He was starting on the next row when the blade bit his leg. She was still exclaiming, no, scrambling from beneath the table, when the kitchen door opened and her grandfather stepped into the room carrying a basket of potatoes. As he washed them at the sink, Lizzie patted his legs, searching for the cut beneath the rough fabric of his trousers. What is it, Lizzie, he said. Do I have mud on me? She told him what she'd seen. I'd have to be guy clumsy, he said, to cut myself digging tatties. She was still wondering why she'd seen a scythe, not a fork, why the sun had been shining though the sky was grey, when her grandmother returned and together they went to feed the hens. By the following July, when Neil, their neighbour, carried her grandfather home in a wheelbarrow, She'd forgotten the scene beneath the table. Only as Dr. Murray made dark, untidy stitches in Rab's leg did she recall her glimpse of the meadow months before. She thought of them as pictures because she could see everything so clearly as if she were standing nearby, although she never saw herself. Sometimes she saw ordinary things, her grandmother choosing which hen to kill, a cow stuck in the mud by the river. She saw a picture of Nellie in a white dress at the front of the church, and three months later, 
nearly announced she was marrying Angus. You could have knocked me down with a feather, her grandmother said, reporting the news at supper. Lizzie started to say she had known for weeks, but her grandfather was already talking about the sheep shearing. All this happened at Belhaven Farm, which was in that part of Scotland called the Kingdom of Fife, surrounded on three sides by water. The Firth of Forth to the south, the North Sea to the east, the Tay Estuary to the north. Fife was known for its collieries, its fishing and its university in St Andrews, but the farm was inland, far from the coal mines. The year of Lizzie's birth, the explorer David Livingston died in Africa, the RMS Atlantic sank off Nova Scotia, and the Scottish Rugby Union was founded. On the farm, the most notable events besides her arrival were the mild weather and the early harvest. Where were her parents? On the wall of her bedroom. Her mother had made the drawing the day they got married. Helen, wearing a dress, the folds nicely shaded, was sitting in a chair. Teddy, in his Sunday suit, stood behind her, his left hand resting on her shoulder. Lizzie seldom glanced at them, but every morning she looked at the little white house with two red doors, which had belonged to Helen and which stood on her chest of drawers. In fine weather, the woman came out of her door. In bad weather, the man emerged. Sometimes each hovered on the threshold, but they could never come out at the same time. Besides the weather house and the drawing, Lizzie had inherited her mother's border terrier, William, whom they buried in the apple orchard soon after her grandfather cut himself, and a handful of stories. Helen could undo any knot. She could imitate a thrush so that the birds sang back. She had rescued a calf from drowning in the river. She was partial to gooseberry jam. About her father, Lizzie knew even less. Ted Teddy had been a fisherman. His boat was named St. Philan, after the saint who had lived in a cave on the Fife coast and wrote by the light of his glowing left arm. But neither God nor St. Philan had saved Teddy's boat when the fog rolled in one October day. Seven months later, Lizzie was born. Twelve months later, Helen died. Not because of you, her grandmother had said. Pneumonia. Your father drowned in one way, your mother in another. Thank you. Ah, oh, what, what a perfect reading. Um, it makes me want to just read the whole novel again. And um, that's the warning it comes with. You start and you will not stop. It's um, it's just beautiful, and I feel very lucky that after years of having had the opportunity to hear Marco read her work, it's your voice I hear <laughs> as I'm as I'm reading. Um, I, I was thinking about this and how if I, if I were a grad student looking for a dissertation topic, um, I. I think your works as a whole, the beautiful depictions of your native Scotland, the exploration of the life of orphans again and again, and the exploration of second sight. Mm -hmm. And yet no, no two novels even close to being the same. And yet there's this beautiful web connecting them all, um, like a constellation. I, I would just love to hear you talk a little about the origin of this one. Um, I want to hear both farm and second side, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you. 
thank you for that beautifully eloquent description of my work. I'm honored to think of myself as a very, very minor, distant constellation. <laughs> Not that. And I, I, as, as has already been said, I grew up on the edge of the Scottish Highlands. Um, my father taught at a boys' private school, and my mother, Eva, was the school nurse. Eva died when I was two and a half, and my father died when I was 22. And at that time, I believed myself to have no living relatives in any meaningful sense. My parents were both only children. This belief um, persisted for well over 40 years. And then in 2017, a former student was doing research on ancestry.com and I'm not quite clear about this part of the story. Somehow she ended up doing research on my family. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't know if you know how ancestry.com works, but you can people can see who's working on a family tree. And my former student, the lovely Irene, received a letter saying, did Eva McEwen have a living child? She forwarded this letter to me and I wrote to the writer saying she did and I am she. <laughs> and the writer of this letter was a woman named Gail Phipps, um, a, a lovely, persistent, eloquent person. And um, she rapidly explained to me that I was wrong. I um, did have many relatives. They just all happened to live around Brisbane in Australia. <laughs> so somehow, and this part too is mysterious to me, the next thing I knew, well not quite the next thing, I was on a plane to Brisbane <laughs> to meet these people who claimed to be my relatives. And I was very fascinated by this. I mean, you know, all around me I'm surrounded by people who share their DNA with someone. And I kept thinking, there must be something magical about this. There must be something ineffable. I'll meet these people and I'll feel something I haven't felt in many years. For the most part, this didn't happen. <laughs> Gail gave a barbecue for me and about 30 people came who were my first and second, no, they, none of them were first, who were my second and third cousins once or twice or thrice removed. <laughs> So it was maybe asking a lot of DNA to do something in those circumstances. <laughs> but I did feel a connection with the two oldest members of the family, Gwen and John, siblings, um, who perhaps not accidentally were the people who, with whom I shared the most DNA. And they told me about my great-grandmother, Lizzie Craig. And what they told me, um, which particularly resonated was that she had second sight, was widely acknowledged in the family that she could see the future. I went back to America. I continued writing the novel I was trying to write, which became The Boy in the Field, and continued corresponding with the lovely Gail in Brisbane and hearing stories. But I had no thought about of writing about this material until March 2020. And suddenly I realized to my dismay that I was not going to go, be able to go back to Scotland anytime soon. Like everyone else, I was a prisoner. And this was such a distressing thought that I um, almost, from one day to the next, abandoned the novel I was writing and thought, I must write about Lizzie Craig. I must write something that will allow me to go to Scotland every day. Uh, so the road from Belhaven became my magic carpet. Um, and um, it did enable me in many ways to go to Scotland every day. And it enables us to go to Scotland <laughs> um, as, as we're breeding. Did um, you know so much about farm life? And, and the whole time I was reading, too, just struck by um, how that farm is used to show the passage of time. 
and and not just the seasons, but sort of the gr the greater uh, time of of these characters' lives. And so, what about your experience, or where how did the farm? Well, growing up at the boys' school, um, I found the animals much more interesting than the boys. <laughs> <laughs> but then something terrible happened, and for four years we moved to the borders of Scotland, um, to a small village, and on the outskirts of the village was a small farm owned by a brother um, and sister, Selby and Chrissy, who were like characters out of a William Trevor novel. <laughs> And they had inherited the farm from their parents and really made almost no changes. Um, they had a Land Rover and they had a tractor, but almost no machinery. Um, the farm had a large population of animals because they both had the habit of going to auctions and buying animals who might otherwise have gone in another direction. Um, but I went there really every day and I took care of the hens and the cows and the ducks and um, tried not to get ensnared with the farm cats and um, yeah it, it was a great solace to me at a difficult time in my life and but I did realize that childhood memories were perhaps not quite enough so I also read some wonderful farming diaries of the 1870s and 1880s and I will say, if any of you have trouble sleeping at night, <laughs> let me recommend a farming diary. <laughs> it, it, it tends to be rather monotonous. You know, it rained, we planted the mungo turnips. It rained, we repaired the stone wall. You know, I mean, but I'm very grateful to the authors of these diaries who kept such persnickety records. Well, and also just the, the tenderness with the different animals. I mean, I I also felt their presence as characters. Um, in particular, Alice, and um, should I tell Alice? Yes. Um, Marco was coming, and I had I had left a window open, thinking this wonderful cool air and her room will be fresh. And like a day ago, this little bird came. Mm -hmm. A house, a house bench, <laughs> and then build a nest <laughs> right where Margot's going to be. So, like, right in that window. And uh -huh. and I, I told my husband, Alice. That's the bird's name. <laughs> Alice is visiting, <laughs> and I couldn't uh, bear to move her nest. And Margot's happy with her. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> um, but no, the the. You so get that um, that childlike tenderness throughout. Lizzie, Lizzie is just a wonderful character in in that dare I say Jane Eyre kind of way. I mean, here is the orphan who who is not a victim. She is by in so many ways, but she does not live as a victim and and I found myself so taken with Lizzie because as the reader I was seeing I was sensing threats all around her you know from from that very beautiful beginning you have us in this beautiful place but um, the pictures come and there are people in and out of her life and I'm not quite sure if I trust them 100%. And I'm just wondering how, as a writer, I'm really curious how, how much you knew starting with her story, um, who to trust and who not to trust, or you know, were you aware of all the threat in her world? I'll just circle back to something you began by saying, which is, I do think that there's something about the orphan story, that there's a reason orphan stories have such a hold on our imagination, you know, 
Harry Potter rocks, you know. Um, <laughs> that it, the orphan story is sort of all our stories writ large without a safety net. Um, and then I have, you know, the biases of my own childhood that keep me coming back to that to that material. But I do think that one of the um, you say contradictions about Lizzie Craig is that while she sees the future intermittently, occasionally, she is not a particularly good judge of character. Um, perhaps even not always a particularly good judge of her own character. And so I do see her as someone who's often liable to not act in her own best interests. I think that's a double negative, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I see that, but and and yet, and yet, I was always more with her than I mean. You know, there's a hopefulness, yeah. always, yeah. Um, and and then, but but it's mixed with that, with the fear, also. Oh, well, one of the pleasures of of. Um, writing The Road from Belhaven was that I reread all my childhood books and pretended it was research. And so, <laughs> so um, you know, some of them were books that were designed to make children behave well, and, but there were also much more exciting books like Jane Austen and Bronte's and Dickens, of course, um, Charles Kingsley, Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, you know all these wonderfully exciting books, but the book the book I would the books I wouldn't let her read were by Thomas Hardy, because if she had read Thomas Hardy, she would have discovered that Victorian propriety was not all it was cracked up to be. <laughs> and in 1850s London, I believe one in every ten houses was a brothel. So maybe think about that as you drive home and have a bill tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, so I was really interested in that kind of scrim of Victorian morality that we have taken from novels and from Queen Victoria's massive attempt to um, make the royal family into a kind of moral high ground after many centuries of it being a moral low ground. <laughs> and um, I didn't want, but I didn't want Lizzie to discover through books that there was this dark, mysterious river running under everything of sexual attraction that might make adults behave in very surprising ways. No, no, she, she learns the hard lessons about desire and what people are willing to do. And I don't want to give away any plot, but there, there's there's a lot of that throughout. Um, is there another passage you want to read? Or um, I, I want to say, do I have to? I could read a little passage. I just I just love to hear. I you. could read a little passage about Alice, maybe. Yes. Oh, yes. Seeing seeing she's already been mentioned. Sorry. I should, Jill had mentioned this, but I sort of was in denial about it, so. <laughs> um, 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 they um, hire a farm boy named, named Hugh, um, which is a good thing from Lizzie's point of view, because although she loves the ducks and the cows and the hens, she is also partial to humans. So. Uh, in May, two days before her birthday, Lizzie came home to find a box in the kitchen. A small bird, its black feathers just beginning to bristle, stared up at her with blue-gray eyes. Hugh had found the jackdaw under an ash tree, no parents, no nest in sight. He showed her how to feed it worms and grubs. All evening she kept the bird on her lap, feeling the sharp prick of its claws, stroking its neck feathers. What will you call it? said Hugh. Alice, she said. Last winter they had taken turns reading Alice's adventures in Wonderland. 
Alice's eyes lightened to the grey of the Lochan on cloudy days. She learned to fly and accompanied Lizzie as she fed the hens and ducks. When Lizzie and her grandfather played cribbage, Alice tried to steal the wooden pegs. On her grandmother's birthday, Lizzie tied a little paper banner to Alice's legs. Happy birthday, Flora. In the evenings, while Hugh milked the cows, Alice perched on a hay rack, chattering softly and ignoring the barn cat slinking around in the straw below. As soon as she had done her homework, Lizzie joined them. She told Hugh the news from school. An older boy had broken his arm and had to wear a sling. Miss Renfrew, the teacher, had set, up a, had set a surprise test on the kings and queens of England, and she had passed because Hugh had made her recite the names so often. Hugh, in turn, told her Neil was putting two of these hives in their orchard and would give them some of the honey. And I'll just skip to one more, one more passage about Alice, if I can find it. Um, that spring, Hugh suggested Lizzie take Alice down to the meadow by the river. A flock of jackdaws was nesting in the pine trees. Perhaps she might find a mate. Three Saturdays in a row, Lizzie sat reading while Alice flew from tree to tree, playing with the wind. Sometimes she brought Lizzie a pine cone or a twig, but even when the wind took her near the, their nests, she ignored the other birds. Oh, she's decided we're her family, Hugh said. <laughs> I went straight and looked up the jackdaw, which is crow, raven, very smart. There's a wonderful book by Conrad Lorenz describing how he tamed a colony of jackdaws that I read when I was about Lizzie's age. <laughs> another, another passage that um, stayed with me, and it is so brief but so powerful, is when Lizzie goes to that carnival early. And she's very attracted to the fortune teller. Yes. But her grandmother cautions, you know, the work of the devil. Um, and then my favorite part of that, the pair, you know, she's described seeing Madame Sol is it Solange? Solange. Um, coming out the back at the end and just this witnessing that human um, with this with this power <coughs> and so what what did you learn about how the second site had been viewed by others since since all the family members knew this um, both both the gifts a gift your mother had as well as one thing I didn't say about Eva my mother was that I had a handful of stories about her and those stories nearly all concerned her relationship with the supernatural. Um, she was regularly visited by poltergeists. As a nurse, her patients complained it was hard to sleep because the poltergeists came at night and moved the furniture around. And she also saw people who were not visible to most other people. So when I heard that my great-grandmother also had a relationship with the supernatural, which took a, albeit that took a different form, reading the future, seeing the future. I was immediately very fascinated. I thought, well, maybe that's the DNA thing. Maybe <laughs> second sight or, uh, is something you can well, Yeah, the next question is about <laughs> <laughs> um, The terrible thing is that I haven't inherited second sight, and so, I did what I always do, I did research. Um, and I asked or I asked among my friends and wider circle, and I discovered that I already knew two people who regularly saw the future. And I asked them to describe what it was like, what the experience was like. And that's what I tried to capture in Lizzie's pictures. Um, they described it in intensely visual terms. It wasn't like having a premonition or having a feeling. It was like it really was seeing. Um, 
which I was very fascinated by. But I also think, I mean, putting aside my own predilections, that there's something about the uncanny that, like orphans, the uncanny is good for literature. It italicizes things, it opens portals onto perilous scenes. Um, there's something, I mean, you know, I, I can't really articulate it, but it's a way of trying to write about what you might call the spiritual life. And, and there's a lot of, I, I think there's a lot of overlap um, with the natural world yes. that you describe so beautifully and the animals and the kinds of relationships. It's um, Lizzie's very much in her own orbit, yeah. even as the others. But did, like, did, did family members who knew of the gift of your grand grandmother, great grand great, great grandmother. Great grandma. um, did they think? Did people fear it was the like the work of the devil, or did they discuss? I'm just curious how people responded. They, they found it. This, I mean, Gwen and John, the elderly siblings who told me about it, they they found it interesting, um, not frightening, not they didn't see any dark overtones. Good. The most concrete example they gave me, which it's hard to set, describe it in a way that will make an impression, was that in something like 1938 or 39, Lizzie um, predicted that Japan would enter the Second World War on the side of the Germans. And if you know your history of the Second World War, you will know that was a very unlikely thing to predict. Um, so some of her predictions were sort of larger scale, but many were, oh, you know, the dog is going to fall in the river sort of yes. predictions. <laughs> <laughs> How are we on time? Six thirty. Okay. Oh, good. So, <laughs> um, because now I was going to have Margot read your futures, but <laughs> she 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 closed that door. But I, I are there questions? We'll pause here and see if you have questions. Anyone? Yes. Um, this is for Margot. Have you ever eaten a haggis? As <laughs> I read the description of it, I thought, oh. <laughs> I have read the description of Haggis also. <laughs> um, I am a lifelong vegetarian, uh, so no, I never have. Um, but it was frequently presented to me in, a, in my childhood. Um, it, you know, it's poor people's food. Um, and. Um, it's now become a uh, oat cuisine. You can get um, haggis wrapped in phyllo, for instance, <laughs> in Scottish restaurants. I'm not sure if that's an improvement, but it's an alternative. <laughs> Have you? No. <laughs> yes, it's totally delicious. Taking that a step further, have you eaten an egg without a shell? Um, Lizzie does find these shellless eggs in the in the farm periodically that the hens have laid. Um, I have not. Okay. Um, but you can eat them. Yes, they're, 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 they're quite, I think they're perfectly fine, except not perhaps um, aesthetically very pleasing. <laughs> but one of the things that interested me about the hens was that we would, when we went to the seaside, we would gather shells that we would then break up and we would feed them to the hens and they would turn the seashells into eggshells. And I thought that was so satisfying and interesting. And you have that gift of beautiful eggs tonight. Yes. <laughs> I don't think we should share that with too many people. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes, Sammy. Is it easier to think of the supernatural second side 
um, that kind of thing in a setting like Scotland or Ireland than it is in, let's say, modern day America, in, in Raleigh or Chapel Hill or someplace mm -hmm. so prosaic. I think it must be, in, in a way, um, just that the setting as well uh, must lend itself to the mystery in a sense. Do you feel it all? Um, I do think that it's easier to write about second sight, but that writing about Scotland makes it easier to, to write about it. Um, but I will say that when I wrote the novel about my mother, Eva Moves the Furniture, um, which received many, many rejections, um, one of the main things people objected to was that it was a novel with ghosts. And they said, it's, turn of the screw is one thing, but we don't want ghosts wandering around in other novels. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so one of the things that's been interesting about publishing The Road from Belhaven is seeing how much the climate has changed and that white Anglo-Saxon culture is now much more appreciated, appreciative of other dimensions, if you will. Um, there's a much more interest. Um, I um, have a, a, an adopt, a, being a resourceful orphan, I adopted a family and my uh, adopted father also had second sight. Um, and um, you think my childhood is a, is a wash in these people. <laughs> um, um, he told me, when I asked him why I didn't, he said, I believe you have inherited your mother's gifts, but your life is too busy and too urban. Ah. <laughs> so I think, um, well, maybe, that, maybe it will change. Um, um. But it is true that it's a little harder to imagine a ghost on 42nd Street. <laughs> maybe they're there all the time. Yeah. I'm thinking of Itzhak Dittison, who wrote all her Gothic tales. In, in in a northern setting, you know, yes. whereas she couldn't, I'm sure she couldn't set them in bright sunshine, Kenya or Africa. And yes. so there's something about the mists and the, the setting yeah. that that, uh, that makes it much more appealing in a sense. <laughs> Although I will say that I've been working at Iowa with a number of students from Ghana and Nigeria and South Africa. And they have quite a strong mm. sense of the supernatural. Mm. Oh, yes, of course, yes. Of, of ghosts there, so, yeah. Except we call it superstition, don't we, when it's in Africa? Yeah. I think you may need to go on a sabbatical to get in touch with this. Yeah, I'm familiar with, with Jill and Corporal and uh, her work, and I think it was in North Carolina. And I saw this advertised in a in a, um, a newsletter from London that, I, and so I saw Jill and I saw um, uh, the road from Bellhaven. <laughs> I thought of Bellhaven as um, you know uh, near Aurora or Little Washington is what I was thinking, and didn't look into it any more. <laughs> She was going to be here with you, so I knew it was going to be good. <laughs> so I, I got the book and just read just a little bit while I was, was here waiting, so I'm really excited to to read it. So I was thinking that Bellhaven was down east. <laughs> <laughs> but, so after that little bit, my question is, uh, how did you leave Scotland and come to the First, I'm going to answer your implicit question about Bellhaven. <laughs> I thought I had invented the place. I have my father's atlas um, from uh, 1958, and I checked the index, and there was no Bellhaven. So I thought, great. But um, it's subsequently, I discovered that um, a, much, a more recent atlases do list a place called Bellhaven uh, in Scotland. And there's also a very well-known brewery <laughs> making, I believe, excellent beer. I'm trying to persuade them to sponsor me. <laughs> so, um, so Belhaven is a real place, but my Belhaven is a different 
play, a different real place. <laughs> um, I came to North America for love and I stayed for work. <laughs> That's the short version. <laughs> but you go back often. I, I go back often and I have found love in North America. <laughs> it's not too sad. <laughs> I actually um, went to support Flyleaf and um, I was looking for an opportunity to come and I saw Road to Bellhaven with a crow and I don't know if it's New York City or someplace there's a well-known psych hospital called Bellhaven. Does anybody know yeah. that? Bellevue. 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 Okay, see there. But I thought, oh, it's kind of a mystery. So it is interesting. <laughs> I'm, if I had known you, I also would have gone to Bellevue. <laughs> Well, those of you, you came and you you are in for a wonderful, wonderful treat. Um, and I love, you know, even in the two readings you gave just now, the second impromptu, um, but it's so, I'm so aware of the images and the echoes that just circle and repeat throughout the novel and and that beautiful opening in fact as you're reading you should just think of it as a circle that's going to keep getting bigger and bigger and with the smaller one when you, the mention of the the royal lineage and the quoting and and it's what she does you know to keep herself yeah. in check there um and again this is this is my curiosity as a writer. How much of that um, do you recognize it as you're revising and enhance? Because um, it is so tightly um, connected. I wish I did recognize things, um, <laughs> but like many writers, um, I uh, lose my vision as I continue to write and. Uh, Happily, I have a dear friend, Andrea Barrett, whom a wonderful author, most recently of a collection of stories, Natural History. I um, send her almost everything I write longer than a postcard <laughs> and wait for her to use the word masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> and then she phones me up and she explains that we really do not need 47 pages about feeding the hens, although the hens are intoxicating and lovely, five pages will do. Um, and um, over and over, she helps me to see my work more clearly. I'm, I'm hugely in her debt. But I did want to say that um, I was constrained in the dates I chose for the novel by a desire to stay faithful to my great-grandmother even though no one was going to care but one of the things that also interested me about that period was that it is the great age of industrialization in, on both sides of the atlantic and that meant that people who lived in the country finally had choices you could leave your farm you could leave your family and you could go to the city and you could earn a little bit of money and um, I thought that was, I think it's just a particularly interesting period to write about. And Glasgow at the, in the second half of the 19th century was an industrial powerhouse. It had the wonderful Singer sewing machine factory that turned out 13,000 sewing machines a week. And it had the huge shipyards. Um, now my characters aren't directly in, involved in either of those, but there was something about that that those choices they had um, that I found very interesting and appealing. Well, and the Sicker Sword Machine Factory does um, yes. factor in, and, and also just the whole profession of being a tailor. Yes. And um, again, things, things on the page that were fascinating to read about and learn. Did you research that? I did research being, I'm a terrible seamstress, but I did research being a tailor in a sort of modest way. And I did discover that my great grandfather was um, 
the tailor to the Brisbane pipe band. I mean, who knew Brisbane <laughs> had a pipe band? But he made their kilts. Oh, <laughs> sure. And what about the royal language? Is that, um, did you memorize? <laughs> I did have to memorize kings and queens. Oh, and, but it's interesting how, talking about how you think your way into research. When I first, in the first early draft of the novel, I referred to Elizabeth I. But obviously that's historically inaccurate because at the time, there was only one Elizabeth, so she was just oh. Elizabeth. Um, and similarly, for instance, I made Lizzie have a doll's tea party, doll's plural, and then I realized, oh no, most girls only had one doll, if they had any doll. So there were many places where, um, you know, Did the copy editor catch? You know, these were things that Did I found they, when I went when? back to read letters and diaries. Um, mm -hmm. Wonderful. Other questions? Yes, the example of, I think you said it was your grandfather who was the tailor. How, like, what data bank did you find that? I mean, was it um, census and they indicated the job? Census records? Um, it was, it was a family story. Yeah. Yeah. And I should say that one of the things that was very liberating was knowing so little. Um, when I wrote Eva Moves the Furniture, I tried very hard to capture what the stories people had told me about my mother. And one of the more distressing moments was giving the, this small group of people the, the finished novel when it was published and then reading it and saying, this is, this is a lovely novel, darling. But it's not your mother, it's not Eva, it's not the person we knew. And I realized I'd created a kind of simulacrum of my mother. And so it was great for me that nobody who knew Lizzie Craig was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was no one to be disappointed in my creation of her character. Yes, Alex. I've been sitting here trying to come up with a way to ask you a question about not having second sight, but being a novelist. And I think you just sort of pinpointed it, that you, you couldn't, I guess, in a sense, go back and feel your mother or experience your mother firsthand. But you create her in a way that makes sense to you based on what you learned about her. And so maybe you do have a little of that familiar second sight you just developed it in a different way. Thank you, that's a very beautiful way of putting it. I do think that at the moment, writing is my main form of second sight and, and perhaps sometimes rereading, you know, those moments when you're rereading something and you've mostly forgotten it and suddenly you think, oh, it's not going to go well for Romeo and Juliet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It comes flooding back to you. It's sort of like second sight. <laughs> historical fiction element of this book, which I'm unfortunately not familiar with, but I feel like I'm familiar with it because of this. Um, but I wonder, um, in, your, in your research, it sounded like you sort of wrote the first draft of Best You Could and then went back to letters and other research that helped you to sort of edit out what <laughs> those anachronisms. Um, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that, about just the way you done the research. Well, one of the wonderful things about COVID was that, you know, I could really only travel in books and I did do a tremendous amount of, of reading um, during those months when I couldn't go further from home than I could bicycle really. Um, I did both things at, I, I did both things at once. I, I kept writing the novel, I kept trying to figure out what I needed to know. I kept pestering my adopted family in Scotland where the primrose is out, how are the lambs doing? Tell me, <laughs> tell me what you're seeing out of your window. Um, and then once I had something that resembled a, a complete draft, I began to look for places where I, I knew I didn't really know quite enough and to try to learn more. But 
for me, research is, I don't know how Jill feels, but it's one of the great pleasures of writing fiction. It's uh, so great to be able to try to find out about the world and call it work. <laughs> but it's also woven in so seamlessly that it, it, it feels like you, you just automatically know it all. You know how sometimes you read something and it, it feels like it all pauses and you're going to step off and do the aside explanation. And never, ever is so fluid. Well, I was very committed to writing a short novel. I didn't want it to be, I love, I mean, I love many long novels. I just finished Danny of Deronda last week, but I really wanted to write something that was short and moved quickly and so that the historical, the research would be there, but it would feel sort of light somehow. Mm -hmm. Not lightweight, but right. like uh, moving lightly. It's not lightweight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, at all. Okay. Maybe we should, one last question. Anyone have a last question? Or yeah. I could answer yeah. questions privately. I think I heard they, I mean, I think they did sell out. If, um, well, the last one. Ah, Kathy got the last one. But they did say they have book plates. So, so if, if, People were going to order. There, there will be time to yes. sign those. So one more question. Question. I'll ask a question. Yeah, Carter. That's a two-part question. <laughs> um, did you say you were writing *The Boy in the Field* at the same time, or you'd finished that? I was writing *The Boy in the Field* when I went to Australia okay. and met met my Australian relatives. I can't help putting the word in several quotes, but I know that they are. You know, they are my relatives. Um, and then I started another novel, um, very different from The Road from Belhaven, mm -hmm. um, but not sufficiently Scottish. <laughs> Did you know where this one was going in that first draft? You had the place and you had the character. And... I did, because right. while I was in Brisbane, I learned one word, and I was writing towards that word. Mm -hmm. And if you read the novel, find the word. <laughs> or after a suitable interval you can email me and I'll tell you. <laughs> well thank you, Marco. Thank you.